We'll be reading Psalm 23 from the English Standard Version. Let's read it together, can we? And let's read it like we know who we're talking about. Amen? Let's go. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Can we say overflows? Overflows. Surely, goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. We're going to do verse 6 again and I want us to do it collectively. So where we see I, we say we. Surely, goodness and mercy shall follow us all the days of our lives and we shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. The word of the Lord. Are we ready to worship the Lord? Not thinking about who is beside us, but honoring our God, amen.
down in worship to sing the song of ages to the Lamb. And all who've gone before us, and all who will believe, will sing the song of ages to the Lamb.
the Lord. Hallelujah. He's worthy. Amen. He's great. this time we'll be approaching the throne of grace I'm going to ask all the children in the building you're asked to make your way over to children's church at this time all the children that are in the house please make your way to children's church let's just lift our hands right now and just thank the Lord for his rich presence that we feel here this morning thank you Jesus 
Thank you, Jesus. Who could it be but you? Hallelujah. If you don't mind, I'm just going to ask you just to hold the hand of one person that stands next to you. And we're going to all pray this morning. Father, here we are this morning. We are here, Lord, not because of any good thing that we have done. We're here simply because of your grace. It's your grace that has kept us thus far. And it's your grace that's going to lead us home. We thank you, Lord, that you saw it fit to bring us into your family. Songwriters said there were millions in the world who were so much better than I. But you chose me. Why? I'll never know, but I'm glad you did. I'm glad you did. How can we ever say thanks for all that you have done? Ah, none of us inside here this morning could ever do anything that would be deserving of your love. None of us could live up to that, Lord. And we're beginning to understand now that it's you that is in us that is enabling us to do what it is that we need to be done. Because if we were to depend on our own strength and our own intelligence and intellect, God will be a disaster. Thank you for this assurance this morning. Thank you for this assurance this morning. Thank you for this treasure that we have in earthen vessels, Lord. Ah, we worship you this morning. For you alone truly deserve all the praise and all the glory. God Almighty, I just want to present to you this morning every individual that is in this auditorium this morning, those who are watching us on YouTube Live who faithfully join us every Sunday. I lift every individual to you this morning, Father, in the name of Jesus. There are those, God Almighty, who are suffering, who are hurting, and God Almighty, they need you. There are people, oh God, who are hurting so bad they don't even want to share with others. They find it difficult to relate because of the pain and the hurt that they're feeling. But I pray, God Almighty, that within the body of Christ, we will be so sensitized, God Almighty, that we be able, dear God, to recognize that when someone is hurting, when someone is in need, God Almighty, and we will open our bowels of compassion and minister to that individual. That is what the body is about. Help us to be so sensitive, God Almighty. I pray especially this morning for our ushers and our greeters, God Almighty, they are the first responders to individuals who walk into this building. God, I pray that you'll give them an a eye, dear God Almighty, that you'll be able to detect when something is not right. Give them an ear, God Almighty, to be sensitive, to know, God Almighty, when an individual is in need. And help them to reach out, God Almighty, to that individual not to know their business or anything, God Almighty, but just to let them know that someone is praying for them. Oh God, the body of Christ is so important, God Almighty. When one part of the body hurts, the entire body hurts. And so, God Almighty, we all need to rally together to minister to each other. Ah, Jesus. 
we thank you Lord God Almighty for the work that you have been doing in our lives the needs that you have met and are still meeting thank you Lord some of us God Almighty are gone through are still going through some deep dark valleys and we wonder if we'll ever make it out but God Almighty reassure us this morning Lord God Almighty that weeping may endure for a night but joy comes in the morning help us to hold on Help us to put our trust and confidence in you, God Almighty. Because we are not depending on our own strength, we are depending on you, God Almighty. For some of us today, as the songwriter said, the sun is shining. But I see dark clouds ahead. And soon we are going to have to face the storm. But we are placing everything into your nail scar hand this morning. For we know you'll understand and see us through. We're depending on you, Jesus. We're not depending on any human being this morning. We're not depending on the government of this world. We're depending on you, Lord. We're depending on you. So we ask, Lord, that you just help us, God, to be still when things are not going right when we're feeling discouraged, when we're feeling God Almighty disappointments, help us just to be still and to know that you are God. And it might be dark now, but there's a bright light that's shining up ahead. And I know God Almighty, you're going to deliver. So we thank you. So we thank you, Lord. We thank you, Jesus. I commit every aspect of this service into your hands this morning. Those that are sick, suffering, God, from whatever illnesses they are, remember them in a very special way. They are members of your body, God Almighty, who in the past couple weeks or months have laid their loved ones to rest and the pain and the hurt still lingers on but I pray for your comforting hand this morning to be extended to those individuals God Almighty wrap your arms around them keep them in your care let them know that you're there keep your loving arms around them Keep your loving arms around them, Father. In the name of Jesus, thank you for your strength. I pray, God Almighty, for the individual that has been chosen to deliver your word this morning. We here at the Grace Workshop Ministry, I believe, God Almighty, you have given us leaders, that have dedicated themselves to studying the Word of God. And I thank, we thank you for them. They have spent hours, or pastored hours, nights, and days studying your Word. And they come every Sunday to deliver that Word to us. I pray that you'll help them never to deviate for what's written in the Word of God. As much as God, it may, may cause some of us to be uncomfortable when we hear it at times. Help them nevertheless to preach and to teach the pure, unadulterated Word of God because that is what is going to take us all the way. That is what's going to sustain us in the time of need. The Word of God. So help them not to compromise in any way with this gospel. God Almighty, 
Help them, God Almighty, to declare the old counsel of God with all fear or favor. Even if it cause discomfort among the brethren, God, the word of God must be taught in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Oh God, if your word doesn't change us, nothing else will. So we're depending on you and your word to bring about the change that is needed within us. Ha. I give you thanks this morning. I place every aspect of this meeting into your hands. Do what only you alone can do. Speak to us this morning, I pray. I will be careful to give you all the glory and all the praise. And can the church say in Jesus' name. Grace and peace, everyone. You may be seated. You may be seated. This morning, I have the privilege of reading in your hearing a portion from the word of the Lord as recorded in Jeremiah 23, 1 to 32, English Standard Version. Woe to the shepherds who destroy and scatter the sheep of my pasture, declares the Lord. Therefore, thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, concerning the shepherds who care for my people, you have scattered my flock and have driven them away, and you have not attended to them. Behold, I will attend to you for your evil deeds, declares the Lord. Then I will gather the remnant of my flock out of all the countries where I have driven them, and I will bring them back to their fold, and they shall be fruitful and multiply. I will set the shepherds over them who will care for them, and they shall fear no more, nor be dismayed, neither shall any be missing, declares the Lord. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will raise up for David a righteous branch, and he shall reign as king and deal wisely and shall execute justice and righteousness in the land. In his days, Judah will be saved, and Israel will dwell securely. And this is the name by which he will be called. The Lord is our righteousness. Therefore, behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when they shall no longer say, as the Lord lives who brought up the people of Israel out of the land of Egypt. But as the Lord lives who brought up and led the offspring of the house of Israel out of the north country and out of all the countries where he had driven them, then they shall dwell in their own land. Concerning the prophets, my heart is broken within me. All my bones shake. I am like a drunken man, like a man overcome by wine because of the Lord and because of his holy words. For the land is full of adulterers. Because of the curse, the land mourns and the pastures of the wilderness are dried up. Their course is evil and their might is not right. Both prophets and priests are ungodly. Even in my house, I have found their evil, declares the Lord. Therefore, their way shall be to them like slippery paths in the darkness, into which they shall be driven and fall. For I will bring disaster upon them in the year of their punishment, declares the Lord. In the prophets of Samaria... I saw an unsavory thing. 
They prophesied by Baal and led my people Israel astray. But in the prophets of Jerusalem, I have seen a horrible thing. They commit adultery and walk in lies. They strengthen the hands of the evildoers so that no one turns from his evil. All of them have become like Sodom to me and its inhabitants like Gomorrah. Therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts concerning the prophets, Behold, I will feed them with bitter food and give them poisoned water to drink. For from the prophets of Jerusalem, ungodliness has gone out into all the land. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, do not listen to the words of the prophets who prophesy to you, filling you with vain hopes. They speak visions of their own minds, not from the mouth of the Lord. They say continually to those who despise the word of the Lord, it shall be well with you. And to everyone who stubbornly follows his own heart, they say, no disaster shall come upon you. For who among them has stood in the counsel of the Lord to see and to hear his word? Or who has paid attention to his word and listened? Behold the storm of the Lord. Wrath has gone forth. A whirling tempest. It will burst upon the head of the wicked. The anger of the Lord will not turn back until he has executed and accomplished the intents of his heart. In the latter days, you will understand it clearly. I did not send the prophets, yet they ran. I did not speak to them, yet they prophesied. But if they had stood in my counsel, then they would have proclaimed my words to my people, and they would have turned them from their evil way and from the evil of their deeds. Am I a God at hand, declares the Lord, and not a God far away? Can a man hide himself in secret places so that I cannot see him, declares the Lord? Do I not fill heaven and earth, declares the Lord? I have heard what the prophets have said who prophesy lies in my name, saying, I have dreamed, I have dreamed. How long shall there be lies in the hearts of the prophets who prophesy lies and who prophesy the deceit of their own hearts, who think to make my people forget my name by their dreams that they tell one another, even as their fathers forget my name for Baal? Let the prophet who has a dream tell the dream. But let him who has my word speak my word faithfully. What has straw in common with wheat, declares the Lord? Is not my word like fire, declares the Lord, and like a hammer that breaks the rock in pieces? Therefore, behold, I am against the prophets, declares the Lord, who steal my words from one another. Behold, I am. I am against the prophets, declares the Lord, who use their tongues and declare, declares the Lord. Behold, I am against those who prophesy lying dreams, declares the Lord, and who tell them, lead and lead my people astray by their lies and their recklessness when I did not send them or charge them. So, they do not profit this people at all, declares the Lord. Jeremiah 23, 1 to 32. Grace and peace, everyone. And a pleasant morning to you all. It's so happy to see you here today. Are you happy to be in the house of the Lord? It is my privilege and pleasure to welcome you all to today's service. It really is good to congregate in this way. 
For those who are viewing us live stream, we wish you could be here, but we're so grateful that you still took the effort to join us in this manner. I do have a few names of persons who are visiting with us today. When you hear your name, I'm inviting you to please stand so that we can acknowledge you. Jessica Ricketts, who is a guest of Casey and McGregor. Welcome, so happy to have you. Also a guest of Casey and McGregor is Elreth Ormsby. Thank you so much for coming, welcome. We have Melissa Davis, a guest of Michael Nicholson. Welcome, welcome. Bless you. We also have Carlene Lemaire, also a guest of Michael Nicholson. Thank you for coming. It's so easy. They seem to be congregated right there. Robert Farkerson, welcome, a guest of Sister Nicholson. Clyde Shaw. Guest of Shanique Robinson and Kimar Coombs, also a guest of Shanique Robinson. Thank you so much for coming. And finally, we want to welcome Michael and Shanique Nicholson, who are here for the baby dedication. Thank you so much for coming. Shanique is a daughter of Sister Penny. So thank you so much for coming. Saints, do enjoy the rest of the service. Give a keen ear to the words of the Lord. Praise the Lord and good morning, everyone. Amen. Uh, as you know, today we use this Sunday to bless our, our babies who are here. And today we have two babies to be blessed. Uh, Azir Aria Josiah White. Um, okay. I'm going to ask you to come and stand right here. And then we have Kai Anthony Nicholson. I'm going to ask you to come and stand here. And then I'm going to ask friends and family members, you can come and stand behind them. Gonna ask us just to stand. We're just gonna read a short passage of scripture as we usually do. It's taken from Mark chapter 10 and reading from verse 13. It says, Then they brought little children to him that he might touch them. But the disciples rebuked those who brought them. But when Jesus saw it, he was greatly displeased. And said to them, let the little children come to me and do not forbid them, for of such is the kingdom of God. Assuredly, I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God as a little child will by no means enter it. And he took them up in his arms, laid his hands on them and blessed them. Amen. I'm going to ask us just to bow our heads as we pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity to have these little ones in your presence. Lord, you allowed them to enter this world. Though challenging this world is at times, Lord, you allow these parents to have this wonderful occasion to receive little children into their lives, not to take advantage of them, not, Lord God, to boast to everyone about them, but, Lord, to help to nurture them and grow them 
in the fear of the Lord. And so we pray as they are here, they will understand their responsibility or godly responsibility. Lord, they thought about bringing their child here. And for that, we are grateful. And so, Lord, we pray they will be impacted by your presence, by the word, by your, by your spirit moving upon them today, knowing that, Lord, you will help them when they call upon you. Lord, as we have heard just this week, promising life of a young man was snuffed out just like that. We are not sure how long we have on this earth. And so, God, we pray the parents, the loved ones, the guardians will cherish their loved one. We pray that, Lord, they will try their best to guide them. But most of all, we pray that they will introduce that little one to you. Because, God, you have the words of eternal life. You are able to see and to help when they are unable to see and help. When they are busy cooking or cleaning, you are watching over that little one. When they send them to school, when they send them to the daycare, when no one else is able to look after them, you are busy looking after them. And so, God, your all-seeing eye is watching over them, Lord. And so we pray that, God, they will understand the partnership with you is greater than any other partnership in the world. And so, Lord, we pray that you will give them wisdom and understanding. We pray that you'll provide the resources needed to help them to grow their child. But at the end of the day, they will understand just as you gave the little one to them, you can easily take him back. And so, Lord, we pray that they will make best of the opportunity that they have today. We thank you, Lord. We pray that the joy that they feel today, they will continue to experience it, Lord Jesus. We pray that God will bless them indeed and bless the little one. We pray that God, the life that is before us or the lives that are before us today, they will grow, Lord God, to be impactful, not only to their parents, not only to their loved ones, but to this country and to this world. Truly, we need more positive influences in our country and in our world. And so we pray that whatever purpose you have for these little ones today, that God, it will be felt in their communities, in their environments, near and far. We give you thanks. We give you the honor. We give you the praise. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Jesus loves the little children, all the children of the world, whether they're black or white, all are precious in his sight. Jesus loves the little children of the world. Jesus loves the little children, all the children of the world, red and yellow, black and white, all are precious in his sight. Jesus loves the little children of the world. Amen. God bless you. and peace everyone I have 
the pleasure of reading our point to ponder for today. The title is <clears throat> Itching Ears, adapted from Got Questions. The Apostle Paul wrote a warning for the church. The time will come when men will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. That's 2 Timothy 4 verse 3. The Greek word translated itching literally means to itch, rub, scratch, or tickle. To want one's ears tickled is to desire massages rather than messages, sermons that charm rather than challenge, entertain rather than edify, and please rather than preach. The people Paul warns about will have, as one commentator puts it, ears which have to be continually titillated with novelties. Itching ears is a figure of speech that refers to people's desires, felt needs, or wants. It is these desires that impel a person to believe whatever he wants to believe, rather than the actual truth itself. When people have itching ears, they decide for themselves what is right or wrong, and they seek out others to support their notions. Itching ears are, cons are concerned with what feels good or comfortable, not with the truth. After all, truth is often uncomfortable. Paul's warning is that the church would one day contain those who only open their ears to those who would scratch their itch. Those with itching ears only want teachers who will assure them that all is well. Teachers who say, peace, peace, when there is no peace. Where there is a demand for something, the suppliers are not far away. Paul says that not only will there be a great demand for watered-down personalized messages, but there will be a great number of teachers willing to provide such rubbish and steer people away from sound doctrine. Evidence today of people having itching ears includes the popularity of messages that do not require people to change, as if repentance were outmoded. Messages that people are basically good, that God is too loving to judge anyone, that the cross, with all its blood, is not really necessary, and that God wants his children to be healthy, wealthy, and content in this world. As people turn their backs on the truth about sin and condemnation, they disregard their need for repentance and forgiveness. And a craving for new and fresher ideas grows, even though there is nothing new under the sun, accompanied by a longing to feel good about who they are and where they're going. Messages that tickle ears can fill a lot of churches, sell a lot of books, and buy a lot of time on cable TV. Some of the early followers of Jesus complained about some of the Lord's words. Many of his disciples said, this is a hard teaching. Who can accept it? From this time, many of his disciples turned back and no longer followed him. Walking away from hard truth is easy to do. In today's postmodern church, we see many walking around, walking away from the hard truth. Some churches that once preached sound doctrine now teach as acceptable the very evils the Bible condemns. Some pastors are afraid to preach on certain passages of the Bible. So-called Christian feminists deny God as Heavenly Father, calling him a she. 
so-called gay Christians are not only welcomed without repentance into church fellowship, but into the pulpit as well. The church's remedy for those who have itching ears is found in the same passage in 2 Timothy. Preach the word. Be prepared in season and out of season. Correct, rebuke, and encourage with great patience and careful instruction. It is a solemn charge made in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who will judge the living and the dead and in view of his appearing and his kingdom. And it contains all the elements needed to combat the temptation to tickle ears. Preach, correct, rebuke, and encourage. The contents of preaching must be the written word of God, and it must be preached when convenient and when inconvenient. This takes great patience and careful instruction, but sound doctrine is worth it. The church's quest to manage the comfort level of its audience must never take priority over preaching the word. The fear of offending people's sensibilities can never supersede the fear of offending God. Rather, the church should follow the example of the apostles. We renounced secret and shameful ways. We do not use deception, nor do we distort the word of God. On the contrary, by setting forth the truth plainly, we condemn ourselves, we commend ourselves, sorry, to every man's conscience in the sight of God. The church today, more than ever, needs to re-examine the teachings it endorses. We need to ask ourselves the following questions. Are our teachings truly from God or simply itches we want to scratch? Are we standing on sound biblical grounds or have we allowed the world to influence our thinking? Have we guarded ourselves from the schemes of Satan? Are we keeping ourselves blameless for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ? The truth is, God is not concerned with scratching our itches, but in transforming us into the image of his Son. Thank you.
Let me 
me know your wisdom Show me things I've never seen before Seen before Lord, I want to be your witness You can take what's wrong and make it right Make it right Day star shine down on me Let your love shine through me in the night Oh, I believe that I'm a witness he can take what's wrong and make it right Make it right I believe that I'm a witness Anybody else believe it? He can take what's wrong and make it right Make it right Day star shine down on me let your love shine through me in the night praise the lord praise the lord lift your hands and worship him amen how many witnesses that he can take what's wrong and make it right hallelujah lift up your hands and worship the lord hallelujah Hallelujah. Is that your confession today? That he can take what's wrong and make it right. Hallelujah. That's a testimony. Oh, hallelujah. Lead me, Lord. I'll follow anywhere you open up that door. Sing it one more time. Show me things I've never seen before I believe that I'm a witness You can take what's wrong and make it right Make it right Day star shine down on me Let your love shine through me In the night Hallelujah Lord Jesus, we pray in this house today May you have the preeminence in everything that we do for the next few minutes while we are in this mode, or your people need to hear from you, I stand in full assurance of my own insufficiency. And if you do not show up, then we are in trouble. But Lord, have your way and speak to us through your word and we will be saved. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, I was going to say before you are seated, but <laughs> most people are already seated. Amen. So we're just going to read from the word of the Lord anyways, from the book of 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses uh, about 4, verse 1 actually, to about verse 6. Praise the Lord. Amen. If I read a few more verses, don't be upset with me. Praise the Lord. In the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who will judge the living and the dead, and in view of his appearing and his kingdom, I give you this charge. Preach the word. Be prepared in season and out of season. Correct, rebuke, and encourage 
with great patience and careful instruction. For the time will come when men, people will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. They will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to myths. But you, keep your head in all situations. Endure hardship. Do the work of an evangelist. Discharge all the duties of your ministry. For I am now ready, being poured out like a drink offering. And the time for my departure is near. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Verse 8. Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day and not only to me but also to all who have longed for his appearance. This is the word of the Lord. Amen. You may be seated to the few who are still standing. Praise the Lord. Second Timothy is the last of the three books known as the pastoral epistles. And this is along with First Timothy and also the book of Titus. Amen. Book is also widely regarded as Paul's last epistle written shortly before his execution by Emperor Nero somewhere between 64 to about 68 AD. In penning this chapter, Paul is fully aware. Any day now, Nero is going to cut off my head. This is the last opportunity I have to convey to Timothy my spirit and my desire as my successor. Amen? In this letter, we will see a kind of changing of the guard as the Apostle Paul passes the baton to the person who will be his successor. If you are an athlete who participates in a relay, you would say that the Apostle Paul is in the exchange zone, which is only this long. And somewhere in the exchange zone, the Apostle Paul has to say, reach and pass the baton before he comes out of the exchange zone or he will be disqualified. Amen? This was a very emotionally charged letter as a result of this. Paul is fully aware, as I mentioned earlier, that this will be his last chance to convey his heart to Timothy. On the way, he ought to conduct his life as a faithful preacher of the gospel and a future leader of the church. I have summarized Paul's charge to Timothy in about seven or eight points. Uh, and I want to just make this point that each of these points could possibly be a message in itself. But I'm focused on something different today. But it's important that we hear what he had to say to Timothy in these verses. First thing that he says to Timothy in ver chapter 1 verse 6 is stir up the gift of God that is in you by the laying on of my hands. Amen. Paul is saying to Timothy, I'm about to exit stage left. And it's my last opportunity to say this to you. It's time for you to stir up the gift of God that is in you. Because my time is over 
and it is your time to lead the church of the living God. By extension, the Apostle Paul is saying to every believer, when you were born from above, the Lord Jesus deposited in you gifts of the Spirit. But it is your responsibility to awaken your gifts. Hallelujah. Tell somebody who is in your vicinity, it's time to awaken the gift of God. Praise the name of the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. In every church of the living God, there are gifts enough to address every situation that the people of God will ever go through. There are gifts for encouragement when you are going through tough times. There are gifts of healing, gifts of humor, and gifts of healing otherwise. There are gifts of exhortation and encouragement. There are gifts of government. By the way, I would just point out that I'm not good at that gift, but I might be good at something else. Don't give me your deadline sometimes to follow. You might be in trouble. But stir up the gifts of God that are in you by the laying on of my hands. Praise the name of the Lord. You know, we have a responsibility in the church of the living God not to be like the man in Matthew chapter 25 who was given one talent. Hallelujah. Some of us, if you are like me, you are a one-talent pony. But don't just bury your gifts. Hallelujah. Because it is beneficial to the church. And when God is making plans, he does not make plan Bs. You are it. Praise the name of the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. I, I used to think that a talent was a small amount of money. I learned while I was preparing for this message that a talent was roughly 20 years of wages for a man. That man was a wicked man. Hallelujah. For he had the gift of a talent. Oh God, I wonder if you know that even though it's one talent, it's the equivalent of 20 years wages and it can do mighty works for God. Hallelujah. I charge you before God and even as I'm preaching here, maybe this is my last opportunity to give a word to this church. Stir up the gift of God that is in you. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. Clap your hands and worship God. The man said to the Lord, Lord, I perceive that you were an evil man because you gave me just one talent. Just one talent. And I couldn't have done anything with just one talent only to find out that it was 20 years worth of salary. My God. My God, that would be equivalent of how much in Jamaica. Boy, praise the name of the Lord. Stir up the gift of God that is in you. Praise the name of the Lord. The second point that the Apostle Paul makes to Timothy is to encourage him. Tell somebody to guard the good deposit of faith which was entrusted to you. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. We are living in such a time when faith means nothing to so many people. Hallelujah. I was in a conversation recently where I realized that my value systems make me the outsider and everybody else normal. I had to take my time and step backwards and out of the conversation hallelujah because the values of righteousness which exalted a nation and sin which is a reproach to every people it's not the same anymore for everybody not everyone will have your Christian worldview they want us to believe 
They wanted to sign policies at work now. And they call it inclusivity and, and, and acceptance policies. But what it is trying to get you to accept is things contrary to the word of God. But I'm here to charge somebody before Almighty God. Guard the good deposit of faith that has been entrusted to you for the time will come when people will not endure sound doctrine hallelujah uh, I may as well just say now that if you came to grace workshop thinking that you were going to cut loose and live any way you want to live you have got another thing coming because as long as we live we are going to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ and declare that righteousness still exalts a nation hallelujah and I'm sorry if you are uncomfortable in your seat when I say this but homosexuality is still wrong uh, and I went as to the farthest extreme but lying is also still wrong you are a heterosexual liar. You are still wrong. And you need to repent and turn to Jesus Christ. And Come on somebody, clap your hands and worship God. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Paul reminds Timothy that, this, that since he was born this faith was in his grandmother Lois and then it was passed on to his mother Lois Eunice praise the Lord Jesus and then it was passed on to him and he's saying to him the book now stops with you now we at the grace workshop we are in a bit of a unique position because not everything that we believed in the past that our grandmothers and grandfathers passed on to us were really right. And my grandparents, for example, still believed in Duppy. And they still believed in all kind of weird things. But praise the name of the Lord as far as the doctrines of salvation are concerned. Guard the good deposit of faith. Hallelujah. There are some things you're going to have to guard. The deposit of faith against. You're going to have to guard it against compromise. Hallelujah. And the spirit that says you don't have to be that extreme. You can be a Christian but be a Christian quietly. You can be saved but don't witness to anybody. Just keep it to yourself. I'm sorry. We in this church have got to do Jesus out loud but we are not hypocritical either. We are doing it out loud but we are doing it right hallelujah as much as we invite people to church we are not going to steal the stationery and as much as we witness of the goodness of Jesus and speak in tongues we are going to show up to work on time because being a Christian is more than what you do here being a Christian is what you do out there the Holy Ghost that makes you dancing here should make you live right out there the Holy Ghost that keeps you in here should keep you from flirting out there the Holy Ghost that makes you run the aisles should make you drive good in traffic come on can I talk to somebody we have got to guard the good hallelujah hallelujah I had a conversation last week. You remember that same conversation I was talking about? Where eventually I had to back out and exit stage left? 
the gentleman was saying to me I hate church people I hate church people I can't stand them and then he went on to tell me about a police officer Christian who kept on extorting him hallelujah and then he went on to talk about some Christian sisters that he had not too decent relations with and I had to say to him ashamed my brother I understand where you're coming from and sad to say when I'm inviting somebody to come to my home to work sometimes I think twice about inviting a Christian because I stand a better chance of having a good deal with someone from outside because when the church people come to your yard they want the most for the least come on somebody but cannot talk to a church that's determined to allow their salvation to follow you out the door we want a kind of Christianity that follows us all the way to our work we have got to be the employees who are model citizens for we are Christians and we represent the name of Jesus we are Christians and our, our co-workers should not look at us and say what kind of God you serve I could never want that God come on somebody I eventually had to retire but before I did I said to the man I'm so sorry but your problem is not with church people your problem is with poor examples of Christian discipleship but there are places where people are Christians and not only in the church but in their everyday life they will not move your border posts they will not throw garbage into your yard but they are Christians beside you and they will help you and encourage you come on somebody clap your hands and praise God and say God the good deposit of faith I'm talking about a practical holy Christianity that goes beyond the doors and the walls of the sanctuary clap your hands and worship God hallelujah 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 come on somebody come on somebody I, I feel like I want to move on but I'm not ready to move from here yet come on church your righteousness has to go outside why is it that the Christians are the ones who come in last and leave first and their workload is the lowest and they are not performing come on can't there be like the three Hebrew boys somebody looking on and saying what an excellent spirit is found in that man I perceive that you are a Christian for they realized that they had been with Jesus oh God may there be an encounter in this church that when we go outside someone is able to say I perceived that that young man has been with the Lord because there's something different and that young woman is not only brushing the dirt with her skirt but her holiness is on the inside and I can't have any rude conversations with her either because something about her is attractive hallelujah come on why is it that even though Jesus was so holy yet sinners flocked to him but we are so holy that nobody no one deal with you something must be wrong we have got to God hallelujah to the Lamb of God let's move on praise the name of the Lord praise the name of the Lord praise the name of the Lord 
Praise the name of the Lord. He then goes on to say to Timothy, do not be ashamed as a servant of Jesus Christ. You have a responsibility that's going to cause you to suffer. I'm so sorry if there's anybody here who has not yet been saved and you're feeling a move or a pull towards God. I need to tell you at the door that you are coming into a life of suffering and you're coming into a life of challenges this is not this thing called the church is not a pleasure barge that's circling the coastlines this is a battleship where you come to fight against principalities and you come to fight against powers and yes you come to fight against yourself for there's something in you that the Holy Ghost has to get rid of to get you into heaven conformity to the image and the character of Jesus Christ is the work of a lifetime and as long as you live you are going to struggle John said I write unto you so that you may know that in this life this a Christian life you will have trouble but fear not for I have overcome the world I'm here to tell somebody that it's going to be rough and it's going to be tough but it's going to be worth it after all I heard a songwriter said when I'm low in the spirit I cry Lord lift me up for I want to go higher in thee yes my granny used to sing that song but the Lord knows I can't stay on the mountain some people want mountain top Christianity but I'm sorry to tell you you have got to go through the valley because the mountain top might get you proud and lifted up but I bet you the valley will bring you closer to Jesus when I'm low in the spirit I cry Lord lift me up for I want to go higher in thee but the Lord knows I can't stay on the mountain and so he picked out a valley for me Jesus leads me beside still waters somewhere in the valley below David said it this way yea though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death you missed it through the valley of the shadow of death come on you still missed it yea though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death he did not say into without any indication of coming out but yea though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death I will fear no evil for thou art with me thy rod and thy staff they comfort me when you're on the mountain top you might feel that your strength or your talents or your gifts is what brought you there but when you're in the valley and your back is against the wall that's when you see the hand of God somebody said them that go down into the sea in ships that see this see it wonders in great waters come on I missed that a while ago these find the works of the Lord and his wonders in the deep Timothy you're coming into this apostleship and I need to let you know that it's going to be rough. And I'm going to talk about that a little bit later. But I just want to let you know now, it's not going to be easy. But it's going to be worth it. Hallelujah. Some people like to say, oh, I soon change my life. And then I'm going to come into the church. We in the church 20 years. And we still not change. If I that you are weird. Pan, I'm sorry for you. You have got another thing coming. It's in here in the valley that you become more like Jesus. Come on, somebody. I heard this one recently and I want to share it here. When you squeeze an orange, 
orange juice comes out. I wonder what happens when you squeeze a Christian. Oh, this should tell you if you are really saved, what comes out of you at work when you are squeezed. I wonder if Jesus comes out or the person that you used to be. Come on, and that's why you have got to be squeezed because if we don't squeeze you, you will not know what's in you. Can I talk to somebody? I'm trying to move on, but something is pushing me right here. Somebody needs to understand that God ain't going to stop squeezing you until his character is formed in you and whatever he's got to do to squeeze Jesus out of you, he's going to do Hallelujah, hallelujah. Praise the name of the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. If you will live godly in Christ Jesus, prepare for trouble. Some people are not struggling because they are not saved. And that's just the truth that we have to tell you from the pulpit. If you're not struggling against sin, you're not saved. I never say I never spoke in tongues at an altar. Let's move on. I'm not, that's not my subject today. Praise the name of the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Number four. He admonishes Timothy to stay focused on the gospel. Timothy, stay focused on the gospel. The things which you have heard of me and the things which you have seen this do and he repeats this about two or three times in the chapter Timothy stay connected with the gospel sad to say every church every church is one bad doctrine away from becoming cultic And it's serious. Every church is one bad doctrine that just shifts the focus from Jesus to Kevin. I hope you understand what I'm talking about. One bad doctrine of before saying, leave your phone at home and bring your cows and your goats. We are going on the ark. Because when you get on the slippery slope of slipping away from the gospel, of slipping away from Jesus at the center, there is no telling where you will end up. Hey, let me tell you something. You better hold me accountable if I ever preach any other gospel than Jesus Christ and him crucified. Don't wait until I'm done preaching. Come drag me off the stage. Please help me. It might save my soul. Tell somebody, stay grounded in the gospel. Now here's where personal responsibility comes in. How are you going to hold Pastor John Mark accountable for something that you don't even know? And how is that different from when you are at other places? And just following things because I saw it go from long time. Time for the church to pass 
I just follow it because of some know it. Time for the church to go beyond. I saw it steer from 1945. And I saw it go steer. If it was wrong in 1945, it's still wrong now. Come on, get back to the gospel. I might as well preach the gospel right now. Everyone here under the sound of my voice. If you have not repented of your sins. And come into a saving relationship with Jesus Christ. You are under the curse of sin. And the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life. I need to let you know. That until you meet Jesus. And settle the account. There's a sword hanging over your head. And any moment now. It can cut down. And yes this will make you uncomfortable. But I've got to discharge my responsibility. To preach the gospel hallelujah but there is hope in this dire message and that's why it's called the good news someone stepped up under the sword and pushed you out of the way so long as you are elect unto salvation and he said let the sword fall on me let me take his place or her place and bear the penalty for their sin hallelujah and so our lives now should be lived ever to repay him so to speak for what he has done come on somebody this is the gospel of Jesus Christ that Jesus died for the elect so that you can live he took your place so you can walk free come on somebody lift your hands and worship God and thank him for the gospel you know the greatest wickedness that ever happened in church people leave from the book and said the Lord told me to tell you like the time I had two prophecies about two different wives both of whom I'm not married to today you know something you know what's the problem you know what was the punishment for a prophet in the old days that was found to be false? I'll leave that right there. But people come into your pulpit and into your home and tell you all kind of lies. And all you do when it doesn't come through is blame yourself and think you didn't have faith. When has God ever told you something that might faithful to the gospel let's move on fifth point he makes flee from sin Flee also youthful lust, he says. But follow righteousness, faith, charity, peace with them that call on the Lord out of a pure heart. 2 Timothy 2, 22. Problem with us in church. And our old folks used to be like that. When they think about fleeing youthful lust, they think that you should run into a marriage And you think that fleeing youthful lust means running to get married. But can I talk to you? And I'm married. I have my license to talk. If you were a lustful young man or woman before you went into marriage, all you will become is a lustful man or woman. 
If you are a homosexual single, all you're going to become is a homosexual married. If you are a dirty little man, all you're going to be is married and dirty. Marriage was proposed as the solution for something that was not the problem. But fleeing it, what I've learned about marriage since being married now for five years, almost six, marriage doesn't change you. It exposes you. I, I, I thank God for the faithful ministry of Sister Allen. Give you an example. Just right before I came up to preach, my cousin was leading. I said to my wife right beside her, you know, your sister singing, running at the family. And she said to me, yeah, run right past you. Marriage, just, just, you see, every time you want to be proud, your wife in your, in your skin. So you think it fixes your problem. It just exposes you. Maybe I can stop a marriage before it happens. If you're doing it for the wrong reason. Come on, you've got to deal with what's going on in the word of God first. And bring your heart back into subjection to Jesus. Because if you are not loyal to him, you can't be loyal to her. If you are not loyal to him, you can't be loyal to your husband. If you do not submit to him, you can't submit to that man because him not not like Jesus and if you can't submit to Jesus can I just be real with you I, I struggled with pornography before getting married and I promise you, December 15, 2018, 18, was not the last time I struggled. Your beautiful wife will be in the bed. But you are around here struggling with pornography. Can I talk to some real people? I'm so sorry. I know I'm making some people uncomfortable, but let's get real. Let's just stand and lift our hands and worship God. Let's say, Lord, help us. It's a hard problem. Tell somebody, it's a hard problem. And hard problems must be fixed with hard solutions. Only the word of God can cut to the heart. Some things you can pray as long as you want. Can I talk to you? You can pray and speak in tongues for one hour straight and go right back home into the same problem. I mean, no true me attack. Because you can't tell lie in a church. And if me ask everybody if you stand up who have that problem, you're going to have to stand up. But I won't. And in that context, he says to Timothy, correct 
with gentleness, with patience, trusting in God's ability to grant them repentance. In Galatians chapter 6, he says it this way. If a brother is taken in a fault, I had a, I had a teacher one time in Bible school. I went to a certain institute some years ago. I had a teacher who is held in repute who told us that after 40 something years of marriage, I have not had my first argument with my wife yet. Two things about that I know he was a liar. But secondly, peradventure, he was telling the truth. I would not go to you when I have my marriage problems because you can't help me. So you who are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness. You can't be meek because you have never had this problem before. Considering yourself, lest you also be tempted. Share each other's burden. And in this way, fulfill or obey the law of Christ. So, it is in this context. How much time do I have left? I'll finally get to where I'm going. The Apostle Paul comes to the final chapter of the final letter to his son Timothy. Turn with me to chapter 4 of 2 Timothy. The Apostle Paul says the following. In the presence of God and of Jesus Christ, who will judge the living and the dead. And in view of the appearing of his kingdom, I give you this charge. Preach the gospel! Remember, this is Paul's last opportunity. Imagine the urgency in his voice. I'm going to be dead in a few weeks. I have to say to you, preach the gospel. Be prepared. Preparation equals discipline. Can I tell you something? I'm going to be very vulnerable right now. You know, one of my biggest problems as a Christian? The lack of discipline. And in some ways, you started to see it in certain places. Sometimes, I don't know about you, but for me, But it doesn't only affect that aspect of your life. It is very invasive. And it will affect everything. Which is why I am sure that today it is very possible and we need the help of the Lord that many members of Grace Workshop are only members because of familiarity or because a move was convenient or because they like pastor and maybe I'm going into territory that is none of my business but I'm already here 
If I don't preach the gospel, drag me off. The Apostle Paul says to Timothy, study to show yourself approved unto God. A workman who does not need to be ashamed, who handles the word of God rightly. Peter says it this way, be ready to tell any man who asks of you a reason of your hope in Christ. I'm giving you homework tonight. Before Monday morning comes and you go back to work, make sure, and I'm not asking you to go and become a theologian, but make sure you can answer to a person who asks, why do you believe what you believe? You can go into the word of God. Hint, hint. The book of John is a good place to start. And Ephesians. And tell them that Jesus says, I don't pray for everyone. I pray for those that you have given me. Let's leave that right there. So he says, preach the gospel. Which indicates that you must know the gospel at least enough to defend your position. Then he says that in preaching the gospel, three elements must be present. Reprove. Rebuke. Exhort. With all long suffering and doctrine. <laughs> to reprove comes from a word which means to convict, to refute, to confute, confute by conviction. To bring to light. To expose. To find fault. To correct with words. To reprehend or reprimand severely. To chide. To admonish. To call to account. I might say this as well. If when you are hearing preaching, it's not accomplishing this, I'm sorry to say, if it doesn't confront you, it's not the gospel. If you can say amen all the time and not ouch, it's not the gospel. Call to account. Can I tell you? Going back to that discipline. Part of this problem was a little thing called red striped beer. You know how I got over that? gospel confronted me right in this church. Did it at home though, not out in public. Now I'm confessing. And it's already under the blood. You can't judge me. To reprove means to demand an explanation to hold accountable 
If you don't want to be held accountable, then the gospel is not for you. Because the gospel is going to confront the madness. And see what that. Second word, rebuke. Comes from a word which means to admonish. To charge sharply. To tax with a fault. Coming to church will not absolve you of the prison sentence that you have to serve. Coming to church and being confronted by the gospel might mean turning yourself in. Because if one way or another, God is going to settle the score. And better you fall into the hands of God than he falls on you. And I can tell you this from personal experience. I spent years defending my wrong. Defining what is sin and what's not. And how far was not too far. Until God. It's time to take account. Because God is not going to let you sin successfully. For too long. By implication. To forbid to chasten and to punish. That's the gospel we are talking about. Finally, to exhort. This is now the gentle side. After you have draped and called to account, then the gospel will also call you to his side. Say, so come, my son. I know I've dealt harshly with you. But come, my son. Faithful are the wounds of a friend. I beat you down because I loved you. It means to summon, to call for, to entreat. Come home, sonny. To comfort. To instruct, to beg, to entreat, to beseech, to strengthen. By implication, to instruct or teach. This is what the gospel in its purest form does. And you know that you need the gospel. Paul says, This is why I have to talk to you like this. Because the time of my departure is at hand. Time will come when people will not put up with sound teaching. The moment teaching starts to expose who you are. You know, that's why people stay away from church. I want to say this right now. If you are on social media and you are hearing me and you have not been to church for a long time, you are not walking in order because you are a part of a body. And a part of the body, Doc, help me here, that is disconnected will start to experience necrosis. And when blood vessels stop going there, the next thing that will happen 
it will start to rot. Don't tell me that you watch TBN and TD Jakes and, and, and Joyce Myers and all those wonderful people online. Or Grace Workshop. A body is a physical place as long as you have the ability to come. You need to be here because there is value in being together in the body. Apostle Paul then summarizes his Christian experience in the following three statements. We may be able only to look at one today. It says, I fought a good fight. And that's interesting. When we look at the words, you will see, I finished my course and I've kept the faith. Now, I started to talk about this earlier, and I'm coming down, I promise. The word fought in verse 7 is a translation of a word from the Greek, agonizomai, or agonizomai, I don't know how to pronounce it, which means to contend for a prize, to struggle. It's the same word from which our English word Agonize comes. So, Paul gives us an oxymoron here. It's the same word that means I've struggled, I've suffered. It's a word which means to contend with an opponent, to wrestle. But then Paul says, it's a good struggle. Tell somebody beside you, don't despise your struggle. Tell somebody, it's a good fight. The Apostle Paul says, all that I've been through, it's a good fight. Why? To struggle is the prerogative of someone who is alive. I told you before, if you're not struggling, you're not alive. Struggling and scars mean that it did not kill you. you no, know, one of the, when you're not preaching the gospel in a church, you know what it ends up doing to believers who are struggling? Some of the things that I struggle with as a young man coming up in a Pentecostal church. Because I was taught to believe that the struggle is the sin. And not the sin itself. So the moment you have a desire, you start to feel dirty already. And past experience has taught you that you can't go to brother so and so because they will condemn you. I want to say to anybody here who is struggling, your struggle means that you have life. Talk to somebody because best believe they are struggling too. If at all they are alive.
And besides, God doesn't chastise anybody that he doesn't love. You want to know if you're a son of God? When was the last time you got a good beating? When you did something wrong? When was the last time you went home and cried and felt ashamed of yourself? Something is telling me to stop here. Let's all stand. We're going we're gonna to close this out for now. Praise the Lord. Musicians help me here for a little while. I want to say to someone who is hearing me. It's a fight. But it's a good fight. Because it's a fight that is producing the character of Jesus Christ in you. Paul says, my beloved children, with whom I've labored, until what happened? Until Christ is formed in you. If you're still struggling, Jesus is not done with you yet. Lord, I want to be Weakness, you can take what's wrong, make it right, make it right. Day sunshine down on me, let your love shine through me in.
to the Lord today for his word we rejoice whenever the gospel is preached and like as we have been saying to you it's possible to preach for years without ever preaching the gospel and it's just wonderful to to be preached to by brethren who not only love God but love his word and this church is blessed in that way but as always brothers and sisters as always we have a problem with application I have a problem with application if talking could make you a good Christian, I would be one of the best. But there is still a gap between what I say and what I do, between what I profess and what I practice. And so today, we are confronted with our lack. And I'm grateful that though we have had to endure rebuke and reproof, correction, that we have the assurance that it is done with long suffering. So God has to sometimes be cruel to be kind. I don't want to serve a God who allows me to do everything I want to do. I want to be corrected when I'm wrong. I want the word to be able to correct me. I want to have a heart that when I hear the word of God, I bow to it and acknowledge that I am wrong. We're going to pray. May I just invite all of us to stand? Brothers and sisters, the Grace Workshop Ministries has no special people here. No great ones, no celebrities. This church is made up of struggling people from the pastor right down or up. All of us struggling, all of us challenged. Nobody here is the finished product. This place is not a museum where God highlights finished product. This is a hospital where persons who are sick are being worked on. And it is to this end, brethren, that we preach and teach. And that is why we have to celebrate Jesus Christ because he's the only one that can help us. Only one that can help us. 
Let's pray. Our God and our Father, here we are. Here we are. In your presence. Knowing, Lord, that we have been weighed in the balances again and we have been found wanting again. We thank you for your word. We thank you for the gospel. We thank you, Lord, for the word rightly divided. We pray, Lord, that your word, which we have heard today, would continue to carry out it's healing long after we have gone through the doors. We pray that we will allow your word to address the areas of our lives that you sent it to address. Help us not to be careless hearers, but careful hearers. We pray, Lord, that you will continue to re orient our hearts and our minds. Help us to understand, Lord, that the work that you are doing in our hearts and in our minds is the work of a lifetime. And there will always be areas that have to be worked on. We thank you, Lord, for your servant whom you use to minister your word to us. We pray for him, for his wife. Lord God, for all who pertain to them, that your hand would continually be upon their lives. If, Lord, there is any person in here who has not made a surrender of their lives to you, who has never bowed their hearts to you and acknowledged you in their hearts and in their minds as Savior and Lord. We pray that that will be accomplished today, Lord God. And we pray that for those who have a saving knowledge of you that we will strive to make our calling and election sure, working out our own salvation with the understanding that you are working in us, giving us both the desire and the energy to work it out. We commit every person here into your hands and we thank you for a wonderful day spent in your presence, in your courts. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Brethren, uh, you may be seated. Sister Michelle is coming to, to give us our announcements. And then we will receive our offering. But afterwards, I'm going to ask us to just spend a couple minutes just walking around and greeting our brothers and sisters. Uh, greeting persons who are visiting with us. Just trying to make everybody feel at home. Um, we, have, we have babies here who were blessed and uh, parents, and we just want everybody to feel at home, amen, and to let them know that we don't consider ourselves to have arrived. We are on a journey, and some of us are just starting on our journey. God richly bless you, all right? Bless the Lord, everyone. Let us bless the Lord one more time. Was it good for you to have been in the house of the Lord today? Indeed it was. Indeed it was. 
I just want to acknowledge and welcome some persons who we didn't get their names earlier, but with us today are John Kelly. If you are here, please stand. Bless you. So happy to have you. In addition to him, we have brother and sister Callum. <laughs> Wonderful. Bless the name of the Lord. Thank you so much for coming. All right. I will beg your attention for our schedule of announcements for today, Sunday, April 28th through to Sunday, May 5th. Tonight at 7 p.m., we have Grow in Grace via Google Meet. We hope that you will join us tonight. And then on Thursday, May 2nd, the long-awaited summit, Search the Scriptures Conference under the theme, The Blessed Hope, a Study of the Last Things. So be coming here again Thursday, May 2nd, 6.30 p.m., for the first night of our Search the Scriptures conference, again here at Michael University Gymnasium on May 3rd at 6.30 p.m., the second night of our Search the Scriptures conference, and then here still, Pastor? Yes. Uh, on Saturday, May 4th at 10 a.m., Search the Scriptures conference continues. Are you excited? Absolutely excited to dive deep into the word of the Lord. Again, it is under the theme, The Blessed Hope, A Study of the Last Things. And then on Sunday, May 5, at 8 a.m., Lord willing, we come here again for focus prayer time. And then we join together for in-person worship service at 9 a.m., and our grand finale of the Search the Scriptures conference will be held here. And then, just to give you an opportunity to save all, all of the biblical truths you would have learned over the weekend, there will be no growing grace on May 5, but we'll hopefully resume for the following week. Amen. Do you like cake? Can I see the hands of those who like cake? What kinds of cake do you like? I heard cheesecake, chocolate mocha. Oh, that sounds lovely. Anybody else likes red velvet cake? What about black forest cake? Are you salivating? All right. Well, the Grace Workshop Ministry Sports Day Committee invites you to our cake sale that will be held on May 27th, 2024. So you can fulfill your sweet tooth desires. You can buy a cake for a child, for a friend, for loved ones. It can be a post Mother's Day gift. Come on out on May 27th and support the cake sale for the Sports Day Committee. Amen? Amen. All right. I do want to highlight as well another announcement. Uh, this one is a funeral announcement for Dejeuner McIntyre, also called Desha. It will be held on May 5th at 10 a.m. at the Kencott Seventh-day Adventist Church on Osborne Road, Kingston 10. We do want to remember Sister Patricia Koch. This is her daughter's funeral. The interment will be at the family plot in John's Hall, Clarendon. Please remember Sister Patricia Coke in your prayers. And everybody else that is grieving at this time, actually. All right, our daily Bible reading journey continues under the theme, Jesus, the great subject of scripture. Today we are at 1 Kings 6, verse 1 to 13. I hope you have been reading to me, I think the Bible is just an amazing book. I mean, it could be a movie and I'd just be enthralled all the time. Have you been learning about Jesus through Scripture? Have you been seeing yourselves in some of these characters that we've been reading about? Can't put them off as, you know, just people, you know, we are like that at times. Amen. All right, our birthday and anniversary acknowledgements. We do want to celebrate with those who are having a birthday today or this week, 
and those who are celebrating an anniversary today or this week. We do want to say happy birthday to you and happy anniversary. I do have here that brother and sister Manaf and Lovett Buford are celebrating their wedding anniversary today. This is their anniversary of 26 years. We thank the Lord for his favor in their lives. We pray that he will continue to sanctify them through the tool of marriage. Amen. For birthdays through April 28th through April 30th, we have Tina Edwards Facey, Delroy Bennett, Colin Leslie, and Laverne Williams. Are any of them here today? All right. If you're watching, do enjoy your birthday when it comes. And then for the lovely month of May, May 1 through to May 4, Patricia Green Blair, Rohan Brown, and Damian Fife will be celebrating their birthdays. Whew, that's a lot of announcements. We turn our attention now to the screens for the Ministry of Giving. I want to take this opportunity just to thank you all for your continuous generosity in giving. It really does aid in our effectiveness in serving you, our church body. And I'll be calling the ushers now to prepare themselves for the receipt of the offering and tithes. Please stand with me while I pray a blessing over the offering. Gracious Father, you are so good to us, so faithful in the good gifts that you give. You are the Father of lights with whom there is no shadow of turning. So we know that you are faithful in all things and you will remain faithful still. So we ask that you help us to be faithful in our giving. Help us to be cheerful and willing givers, not to begrudgingly bring any offering to you so that what we offer can be received as a sweet-smelling savor. We ask, Lord, that what we offer to you, Lord, you will put into effect for the body of Christ here and those who are extended and not with us here as well. Have your way in our lives. Bless us as you always have done and always will do. In the name of your Son, I pray. Amen. Have a wonderful week ahead.